It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Last week, I met with housing advocates in Peterborough and in Barrie, and I heard how this government's refusal to spend federal housing money on housing is putting so many projects at risk. Under its agreement with the federal government, this government promised to build nearly 20,000 new affordable homes over 10 years, but six years later, they've built barely 1,000. The province didn't keep its end of the deal, and now the federal government is taking back $357 million, leaving a giant hole in our housing budget. My question is, why is this government so opposed to building affordable housing that they'd risk losing $357 million? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, in fact, uh, let me uh, uh, update uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, in fact, uh, the province of Ontario and its uh, partners uh, throughout, uh, uh, through with the municipalities and our service managers have actually built 11,000 of the 19,000 units with five years left to go. Uh, speaker. We also had a target, I believe, of 23,000 uh, units that were to be renovated, uh, rehabilitated, and brought back into service. Of that target, Mr. Speaker, five years in, we have actually done 123,000 units, Mr. Speaker, almost 400 per cent of the target. The federal government has unilaterally decided that they want to change the rules, Mr. Speaker, and are unilaterally holding back $357 million. The province of Ontario is committed and will continue to fund our portion of the national housing strategy. Uh, our service managers and our municipal Bonds. partners are in full agreement with the province of Ontario. It is only the NDP who feel differently, Mr. Speaker, and that's why other got more votes than they did in the two by-elections. Supplementary question. The dirty little secret here is that while federal funding for housing has increased under the national housing strategy, this government has cut back provincial funding. And maybe the federal government got tired of seeing their housing dollars spent on, I don't know, private luxury spas in downtown Toronto. So they're taking back that $357 million. My question to the government is why, again, is this government abandoning its responsibility to fund and deliver new affordable homes in this province? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, truly the Leader of the Opposition hasn't got a clue of what she is talking about. In fact, we've increased funding in her own riding by 33 per cent. She'll recall that because she has voted against that 33 per cent. Now, let's unpack, colleagues, what the federal government has decided to do. They've decided to unilaterally withhold $357 million because they disagreed with us on how we should distribute that money. For weeks, we've been saying it is distributed through our service managers. Now, the big bad federal minister of housing is going to punish Ontario. You know how? By distributing the money the same way we have done it for the last 35 years through our service managers. So I say thank you very much for listening to the province of Ontario. Thank you for continuing to distribute the money the way we have done it for 35 years. Unfortunately, unilaterally they decided to hold Response. back $357 million with the support of the federal NDP who could have stopped it right away but chose to ignore it. Mr. The final supplementary. Speaker, Speaker, when government MPPs voted against the NDP's housing motion two weeks ago, they made their position crystal clear. Housing is a human right, Speaker. But this government doesn't believe it is the job of the government to fund and deliver affordable housing. Public funding for luxury spas? No problem. Give $8.3 billion to Greenbelt speculators? Sure thing. Fatten the Premier's office's budget? Why not? But provincial funding for affordable housing? Nada. Why does this government hate public funded housing so much that it is choosing to give up $357 million in federal Order. funding? Members of please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. <laughs> Again, the Leader of the Opposition couldn't be more incorrect. 
We are continuing to fund our portion of the national housing strategy unilaterally. We have decided to continue on that funding, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we've gone a step further with the budget. Uh, not only this budget, but the previous budget, we've actually increased funding to its highest level in history. Now, the Leader of the Opposition, she, of course, the Leader of the Opposition in the entire NDP caucus voted against that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to fund those programs that make sense for the people of the province of Ontario. If the big, bad federal government wants to get on board and help us, we welcome that, Mr. Speaker. We have said for two and a half months that we fund housing through our service managers, through our partners at the municipal level. They have said no, 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 but Response. then they send us a wonderful letter just last week that said, you know what, we're going to punish you by funding the program the exact same way you've done it for the last 35 years. Well, thank you very much. I agree with that. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, well, you know what's highest in history? Homelessness rates right now. That's what's the highest in history. But back to the Premier. A little over a week ago, on a Friday afternoon, right before the constituency week, the government dropped their annual funding announcement for schools. That should have been the first clue, right? Speaker, dropping a major announcement at the last minute on a Friday afternoon. The government thought they would pull one over again on the people of Ontario. They thought that if they gave it a different name, showed some kind of new calculations, and rebranded it, Order. they could confuse you. Order. I'm sure the Premier and the Minister thought that they had outsmarted everyone Order. and avoided accountability, but it turns out they weren't so clever, Speaker. In fact, it's the same cuts again and again, just under a different name. So my question to the Premier is, does this government refuse to adequately fund school programs that are needed by the most vulnerable of our students, and why? Of education. Mr. Speaker, if you could believe it, we also made an announcement on a Sunday because our government seems to be working 24-7 to restrict cell phones, to ban vaping, and to deny social media from school websites. Mr. Speaker, this coming from the member opposite, a party that has a record of literally denying to the public servants of this province by the Ray Day imposition of 12 days of mandatory unpaid leave. This is a member whose party a generation ago cut staff by 5%. This is a party, Speaker, who actually forced teacher unions to use surplus monies in their teacher pension fund to offset teacher cuts that they imposed. This is a government committed to investing in our students and in our future. $745 million more dollars Order. for the coming school year. 9,000 additional education Response. workers. 3,000 more uh, frontline educators. I know the member opposite doesn't want to acknowledge this is a government investing more than it ever before in our publicly funded schools. Order. Order. Supplementary question. I'll tell you, Speaker, back to the Premier again, but we're not buying it. Ontarians aren't buying it. All you have to do is order. talk to one parent in this province Government side, and come to order. that the status quo is not working. It's not working for our kids in overcrowded classrooms. It's not working for our under-resourced teachers. The minister might want to try actually talking to parents and teachers and students. This year, public funding is down two billion dollars lower than was expected. That's only accounting, Speaker, for the current status quo to keep things the way they are, which is pretty darn terrible right now. It's not even including the additional funding that schools need to address the worker shortage, the student mental health programs, the school violence. This government thinks that that's just good enough. So to the Premier, Question. why does he think that just good enough is good enough for our kids? So please take your seat. Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government that has increased funding in public education to the highest levels ever recorded in Ontario history. $745 million more dollars for the school year. I mean, in addition to the monetary investment, this is a government that did what your, your party and the Liberals couldn't do, which is sign deals for three years, delivering peace for children in Ontario. 
Then we announce a revision to the curriculum, the introduction of a kindergarten curriculum that ensures literacy and math is emboldened in the curriculum. We also announce a plan to remove distractions, to ban vaping, to eliminate social media from school devices. This is a common sense plan bolstered by support. $17 million of mental health funding. The member opposite speaks about mental health. This is an issue we care about. There's a reason why we've increased funding by 550 per cent. We're continuing to invest. We're also continuing to demand better better outcomes from the investments we make. That's the difference. We actually will hold school boards to account to expect better outcomes Response. on reading, writing, and math and the outcomes of our kids. And the final supplement. Speaker, Speaker, we saw what happened in this province when Conservatives applied their so-called common sense boy, and we're still recovering from it. Absolutely terrible. The Minister of Education has pile after pile of application for capital builds in of our schools while kids are sitting in portables and they're collecting dust on his desk. The government has made a habit of stashing away so-called contingency funds to give them free reign on spending. We see this over and over. And we're seeing it again with $1.4 billion allocated for planning provisions, quote unquote, that is not accessible to school boards. Core funding isn't really core funding if it isn't actually available to our schools, Speaker. So to the Premier, is the government disguising this new slush fund under education funding to hide the massive cuts to public education in our schools? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, this is the government that doubled the funding to build more schools in the province of Ontario. 136% increase in funding. 136 per cent increase in funding, and yet we also announced a plan to cut it by half, the construction timelines, and yet the member from Davenport has a history, including when she was critic for education, for opposing increases that help families in Toronto, increases that would allow us to reduce the backlog of maintenance that she enabled when she propped up the Liberal Party. This is an opposition that can't accept a basic premise. It is a progressive Conservative Party for that water cut child care fees by 50 per cent. It's a progressive Conservative Party that is increasing increased capital and funding by 136 percent, and it's a progressive Conservative Party that is increasing literacy and Order. math rates for the first time in a generation. We are getting Leader the, the opposition to join us for the benefit of kids in Ontario. Please stop the clock. Once again, I'll remind the House that it has been the established practice of this House that members should not use props, signage, or accessories that are intended to express a political message or are likely to cause disorder. This also extends to members' attire where logos, symbols, slogans, and other political messaging are not permitted, unless the unanimous consent of the House is granted. This legislature is a forum for debate, and the expectation in the chamber is that political statements should be made during debate rather than through the use of props or symbols. Order. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. I must warn the member for Ottawa Centre. The member for Hamilton Centre will come to order. The member for Hamilton Centre is warned. Sarah Jama, you are named. The member is currently not eligible to be recognized in the House pursuant to the order of the House adopted on October 23, 2023. As a result of being named for the remainder of the day today, the member is ineligible to vote on matters before the Assembly, attend and participate in any committee proceedings, use the media studio, and table notices of motion, written questions, and petitions. You must leave the chamber.
order. Order. <laughs> member for Kitchener Conestoga, it's totally inappropriate to make reference to the absence of any member. We can start the clock. I think the next question, the member for Ottawa West EP. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister of Education would rather talk about anything but what's happening in our schools right now because the situation is pretty grim thanks to this government. Schools are turning down the heat to save money, telling teachers to bring in their own supplies. Kids with special needs are being sent home because there's no one left to look after them. Teens asking for mental health support are waiting over a year to see a social worker. And in the face of all this, the Premier is once again proposing education funding for next year that doesn't keep pace with inflation or enrollment growth. This is another cut, Speaker. Why does the Premier not believe that children in Ontario deserve a high-quality education in safe, supportive, fully-resourced classrooms? By the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing funding by over $745 million for the coming school year because we believe in restoring focus, discipline, and some common sense back in Ontario schools. And that's why, Speaker, we've increased the funding for the coming school year to the highest levels ever. We've also committed and we have hired 9,000 more education workers. 3,000 additional frontline educators. We have 900 additional teachers being hired for literacy and for math. Mr. Speaker, this is a historic investment underpinned by a reform to the curriculum that infuses life and job skills. It actually ensures financial literacy and coding and phonics is returned to the norm in Ontario schools. We know there's more work to do, but I would hope members opposite would join our government and our Premier in increasing the funding and the staffing and the expectations in Ontario's publicly funded schools. And the supplementary question. I guess the minister's math is so basic, Speaker, that he's never heard of inflation. The Premier is providing $1,500 less for each child in our schools compared to 2018. This at a time when we have a massive teacher shortage, a problem with violence, a mental health crisis, not enough special education or ESL supports, transportation problems, and crumbling schools. As a parent, on behalf of parents across the province, I want to know, why are you attacking our children's education? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I think parents want us I think parents want governments to act on their priorities that are impeding their ability to learn in the classroom. That's why we announced a plan to restrict cell phones, to ban vaping, and to remove social media from the in-class learning experience. That is represented, supported by 85 per cent of families. So if we want to listen to the people we represent, then the overwhelming majority of parents will say, go back to basics, remove the distractions, end the nonsense, and make sure my kids are proficient in literacy and in math. And that's Order. exactly what we're doing. The Better Schools with Student Outcomes Act repatriates that power back to the people, puts parents in the driver's seat, ensures transparency on school boards, and benchmarks their performance according Order. to academic achievement, which is what education is supposed to be about. We have increased the funding, we're increasing the expectations, and we're adding more staff to Response. make sure our students are set up for long-term success. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the extremely busy Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last week, Speaker, our province welcomed an historic investment in my riding of Simcoe Gray. Honda's one, uh, $15 billion investment in Ontario is the largest auto investment in Canadian history. Here, here. This general investment will create jobs not only for my constituents in Simcoe Gray, but right across our great province. Premier Ford has called Minister Fidelli the architect of the Honda deal. And not surprisingly, Minister Fidelli has credited the Premier as being the best closer you have ever seen. The reality is, Speaker, that this dynamic duo got it done for Ontario. <laughs> Speaker, can the Minister take us behind this historic deal? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. 
Speaker, Honda's $15 billion investment is a game changer for our auto sector and for our entire province. This would not have happened without Honda's long standing history here in Ontario, and especially with the dedicated team of workers at Honda who produce some of the best selling vehicles made in Canada. Premier Ford, as you heard, the best closer at the negotiating table and a strong team. Thank you to them. Our team, who were introduced earlier with their deep understanding of the auto sector and the officials in our ministry and their tremendous work and countless hours, every member of this government, treasury, finance, infrastructure, energy, mines, labour, it was an all-of-government effort. Speaker, this Response. is a new chapter now in Ontario's auto sector. We are an EV manufacturing powerhouse. Supplementary question, back to the member for Simcoe Gray. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Speaker, when you look back to where Ontario was before this government took office, you really get a sense of how monumental this investment is. We had an auto sector that was on the brink of collapse, and the previous Liberal government's response was to throw in the towel on Ontario's manufacturers and our workers. They implemented policies that sought to restructure the composition of our economy by crushing our goods-producing sector so that we could become entirely dependent on the service sector. As a result, Speaker, 300,000 good-paying jobs left our province. But now, Speaker, our province's landing investments that were unthinkable six years ago and bringing back jobs by the tens of thousands. Speaker, can the minister explain what this new investment will mean for Ontario's economy? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Honda will build an EV assembly plant and a battery manufacturing plant at their facility in Alliston. This $15 billion investment of Honda's will create 1,000 new good-paying jobs while retaining 4,200 jobs at that plant. But, Speaker, they will also build a cathode plant through a joint venture with Korea's POSCO and a separator plant through a joint venture with Japan's Asahi Kasei. Now, these are both multi-billion dollar joint venture announcements as part of Honda's $15 billion investment. These both will create significant new jobs in two Ontario cities, which will be announced in the coming weeks. Response? Speaker, in addition, there will be tens of thousands of supply chain jobs created all across Ontario because we are the EV manufacturing powerhouse. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A recent Ombudsman report has revealed fatal gaps in youth support and has made 20 recommendations to York Children's Aid Society. Mia, a 16-year-old young girl, repeatedly cried out for help. She needed a foster placement. She wanted to return to school, which are all within her rights. Mia's rights were ignored and she was shockingly told to go to a shelter. Premier, are you going to adequately fund our children's aid societies, are you go or, or are you going to continue to leave children like Mia behind? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Speaker, the death of any child or youth is a tragedy. And we've reviewed the report and take it very seriously, Mr. Speaker. And we agree with the Ombudsman. The best interests, protection, and well-being of children is paramount in the child welfare system. And our government expects York CAS and every children's aid society in the province to ensure that children and youth's voices are heard in their decision making and their well-being, Mr. Speaker. And we will never waver from our commitment to keeping children and youth safe, regardless of their circumstances, Mr. Speaker. Which is why that's what's driving our comprehensive of redesign of the child welfare system, Mr. Speaker. That's the most, in most recent bill that I introduced last week, the Children's Future Act, that which the member debated on. We saw that it was passed in second reading through the redesign, Mr. Speaker. We have initiatives to improve out-of-home care, to make sure that we Response. hold bad actors to account, Mr. Speaker. And once again, let me make it very clear, we will never waver from our commitment to making sure every child, every youth is safe in this province. Yeah. Mr. Supplementary question. 
Not wavering from a commitment would mean ensuring that there's proper funding uh, for the Children's Aid Societies, which there is clearly not. Speaker, time and time again in this House, your government has made promises to children and youth in care. Two weeks ago, legislation was introduced outlining small steps in the child welfare system. Small steps in a system that Mia tried to navigate herself while in emotional crisis. A system which turned its back on her and broke its promise to keep her safe, housed and protected. So back to the Premier Speaker, what has your minister done to ensure there will never be another Mia anywhere again in this province? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, as I said, every child and every youth in this province need, it needs to live with safety and security. And Mr. Speaker, and we make sure we'll make sure that we take every measure to make sure that happens. Speaker, in the recent bill that, that I that I mentioned earlier, the Supporting Ch Children's Future Act that we introduced a couple of weeks ago here in this bill, Mr. Speaker, we are going above and beyond what we've already introduced, and I made it very clear in the bill. The member calls it small steps, Mr. Speaker. I said this bill is just one of one of the many steps that we're. Right. The child welfare redesign, Mr. Speaker, what never took any action by the previous government, and this That's member right. was here. It was our government that said, through the child welfare redesign, we will make sure we won't leave anyone behind. That means in, in introducing fines and making sure that the Response. bad actors are held accountable. None of these provisions included. A mountain come none north. of these children and youth were being cared for, were being looked after. Right. We'll make sure that this bill, through this bill and other initiatives, we'll make sure Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. My riding in Richmond Hill and everyone knows that the Liberal carbon tax does nothing to reduce emissions. It is fueling the cost of living crisis Ontarians are already going through and burdening families with one tax hike after another. Speaker, Ontarians won't be fooled by the Liberal's tax grabbing measures. Unlike the NDP and the independent Liberals, our government knows that a carbon tax is not a solution. That's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have shovels in the ground on new clean energy infrastructure. Speaker, can the minister please explain our government affordable approach to ensure that Ontario has sufficient energy capacity to meet growing needs without a carbon tax? To reply, the Minister of Energy. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I can do that. Through powering Ontario's growth, we're going to ensure that we have the clean, non-emitting, reliable, affordable electricity that we're seeing right now, but into the future. This type of affordable, reliable, non-emitting energy is what's actually allowed us to land the historic multi-billion dollar Honda deal, which Minister Fidelli was just talking about last week, $15 billion investment at four different plants across the province. Through powering Ontario's growth, we're ensuring that we have a small modular reactor, not just being talked about, but under construction at Darlington right now. Three more SMRs are going to be going in at that site. Mr. Speaker, we have the first large-scale build that's about to get underway at what's already the world's largest nuclear Response. facility at Bruce Power. We have a non-emitting procurement that's underway with the ISO. We have the largest battery storage, Mr. Speaker, procurement underway. We have a lot going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response and those exciting updates. It is encouraging to hear that our province is well positioned to provide clean, affordable and reliable energy for the people of Ontario and for businesses that are looking to invest in our province. And we're doing it without forcing Ontarians to pay a punitive carbon tax. As Ontario moves towards an electric future with a strong electric vehicle supply chain network, the need for reliable, low-cost and clean power has never been greater. 
Unlike the federal government's carbon tax disaster, our government has a real plan to ensure that our energy supply will continue to meet the needs of a growing population and industrial expansion. Question. Minister, can min can, uh, speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what our government is doing to build a strong Ontario and strengthen the competitive advantage? Minister of Energy. Well, what we're not doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're not imposing a carbon tax, a punitive carbon tax like the federal government is doing. The Liberal leader, the Liberal leader here, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is in full support of Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, in bringing forward this carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. But in spite of that, we're continuing to move forward with non-emitting non -emitting resources, uh, Mr. Speaker, like our nuclear facilities, hydroelectric facilities, battery storage facilities, and renewables that will work better because we have the storage that we need in the province. As a matter of fact, as according to the 2024 Greenhouse Gas Registry, and I think the folks that are heckling opposite might be interested in this, it just came out. It says Ontario continues to lead Canada with 86 per cent of total greenhouse gas emission reductions, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is working. We're seeing multi-billion dollar investments Spots. in Windsor and St. Thomas and in Alliston and in Loyalist Township and right across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Their plan is working. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. Last Thursday, Canada released a annual report on greenhouse gas emissions. Ontario is showing sharp increases in GHGs since they bottomed out at the beginning of the pandemic. The report showed increases in Ontario's emissions were the largest in Canada. The Conservatives' inadequate climate plan is headed towards failure. When will the Premier take action to sharply cut Ontario's emissions to protect our standard of living? The parliamentary assistant and member for Windsor to come see. Here, and thank you for the question to the uh, member opposite. Uh, our government's dedication to protecting the environment is clear. The report confirms that Ontario continues to lead the country with 86 per cent of Canada's total greenhouse gas emission reductions, wow. and will continue to build on this success by making Ontario a global leader in electric vehicles and investing in clean steel production, reducing emissions by the same amount as taking 2 million cars off the road. We will continue making historic investments Order. in the critical investments uh, to get Ontarians where they need to be, such as the Ontario line that takes another 28,000 cars off the road every day. Wow. So, in addition to those historic investments, we've also invested in conservation through the Greenland Conservation Partnership, which has protected over 420,000 acres of land. So, we've proven we can protect the environment without imposing a costly, job killing carbon tax on. Thank you. Supplementary question back to the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Premier. We've heard all the stories from the Premier and his ministers, but they don't change the reality that Ontario is not going to meet their targets and it's increasing its emissions under their watch. And that means the government is not leading the fight to protect our way of life, but it is going backwards. Because of climate change, we're headed to a harder and more expensive life for all of us. Why won't the Premier act now? The Minister of Energy. Speaker, we are acting now. We are a government of action that's building new non-emitting resources right across our province. And at the same time, we're ensuring that the price of electricity stays low. And as a result of that, what we're seeing are multi-billion dollar investments in the sectors that are going to actually reduce the emissions where the emissions are. We're going to be building EVs. We're going to be building EV batteries. We're putting in green steel electric arc furnaces at our steelmaking facilities, Mr. Speaker. We're putting non-emitting resources right across our province because we're building out the transmission so we can use the advantage that we have. And it's a clean energy advantage, Mr. Speaker, something that that member wouldn't understand. The people in Milton, the people in LKM, <laughs> disagreed with their proposals last week. They got 6.76 per cent in the by-election. Response. We've got two new Tory members because people are opposed to the federal carbon tax and they're opposed to Bonnie Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax. Order. 
order. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. For the Premier, Mr. Speaker, the Premier campaigned on being transparent, ethical, and accountable. Yet, six years after assuming power, his government has left nothing but a series of scandals in its wake, punctuated by backtracks and broken promises. Five Order. ministers have resigned. Others have been banished from caucus. There's an RCMP criminal investigation with the special prosecutor and judicial appointments for like-minded friends with even a special office in Ottawa for a failed political candidate. Clearly, the gravy train is rolling full steam ahead with the new station in Ottawa. So you'll forgive me for being, for being skeptical of the Premier's taxpayer-funded self-promotional ad saying that everything in Ontario is okay. With shuttered emergency rooms and an unprecedented health care staffing crisis, he refuses to give details about our health care worker shortage, citing the risk of economic damage. Will the Premier Question. break his cone of silence and let his Minister of Health tell Ontarians how bad they have let our health care worker shortage really get? Order. To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. It is an absolute pleasure to tell you how well we are doing in Ontario, in Canada, with our health care system. We have our second match of CARMS. What is CARMS? CARMS is matching residency students with their first choice. And we have all of those residencies now matched in the province of Ontario. Unprecedented it here. It means that students who are training and want to practice in Ontario got that match with CARMS, so please congratulate them. And I have to say, the, uh, the outgoing president for um, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, Sumita Verma, congratulations. 51% of your students at Northern Ontario School of Medicine have chosen family practitioner as their number one specialty residency. We are making progress. We will continue Response. to invest in our health care system because we know, whether it's hospital capital, whether it's health human resources, offering those opportunities for students to train. At Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, that answer had nothing about PSWs, nothing about nurses, and nothing about the shortage of physicians in our province. This government has allowed our health care system to fall into such dire straits that a little transparency would threaten our economic prosperity. This government is terrified that public sector workers will have more bargaining power than they will. They're terrified that even the private sector, flourishing under their protection, could soon be holding them over a barrel, demanding higher rates. Why? Because this government's mismanagement has resulted in the highest demand for health care workers in our province's history. If it sounds familiar, that's because it's the same trademark mismanagement that's got the demand for housing, pardon the pun, through the roof. Mr. Speaker, this government can't make progress on housing and they can't make progress on health care. All they can do is hide from the damage they've done and try to save their own skin. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier Order. give Ontarians a straight answer and tell them how many frontline physicians, nurses, and PSWs our health care system is missing? Order. Minister of Health. Here's the straight answer, Speaker. Two years in a row, we have registered more registered nurses in the province of Ontario in the Ontario's history. We've been able to do that. We have been able to do that by directing the College of Nurses of Ontario, the physicians of surgeons of Ontario, to quickly assess, review, and ultimately license when appropriate internationally educated clinicians. We are making progress. We are working with our partners. We are ensuring that not only capital investments, over 50 different capital builds in the province of Ontario at our hospitals, new, expanded, renovated hospitals, we are doing it with expanding the number of residency positions, the number of positions, seats are available for our nurse practitioners, for our Response. registered nurses, and for our PSWs. We are making the investments, and we are seeing those changes impacting our communities. Not Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Honda's historic investment in Ontario is being talked about across the world, across this province, and certainly across my riding. Global automakers and competing jurisdictions know now 
auto, Ontario's auto sector is back and stronger than ever. Here, here. Demand for electric vehicles will continue to ramp up in the coming years, and we are making sure the supply of made-in-Ontario vehicles is here. This is a massive economic opportunity for our province and one that this government intends to seize. There is not one U.S. state that has secured more auto and EV investments than Ontario in the last four years. Speaker, can the minister explain how, with so many competing jurisdictions vying for this investment, Ontario was successful? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Deals of this scale and of this caliber, they're not made overnight, they take time. Our first EV discussion with Honda was in Tokyo almost two years ago, Speaker, and we knew that going into those negotiations, everything was going to be about relationships and trust. Honda already knew that we have the talent, the clean energy, the EV ecosystem, the minerals, the investment tax record. They knew all that, and now, quite frankly, Speaker, the whole world knows that. Through many meetings in Tokyo, here at home, multiple meetings at the Premier's own home, we cultivated that trust with Honda's leaders, leaders like President and CEO Mibe San, Honda Canada President Jean-Marc Leclerc, Ozawa San, Miyamoto San, and with the Premier at the table leading those negotiations, they knew Ontario was serious about Honda. So thank you, Honda, for this wonderful Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Congratulations to the Minister and his team, to the Premier, for all their hard work in selling Ontario's value proposition to Honda. And it is clear that Honda has confidence in Ontario's ecosystem, our talent, our workforce, and our leadership. Honda's investment proves that, once again, our government's targeted and responsible economic plan is a winning one. Tens of thousands of good-paying jobs are being created right across our province, and investments in our auto sector will strengthen our economy for decades to come. Under the previous Liberal government, that sector was hollowed out and signaled to companies that they should make things abroad rather than Ontario, and no one could have imagined at that time, Speaker, how we have bounced back. Speaker, can the minister explain to this House what our government has done to position Ontario as a jurisdiction where automakers need to be? Again, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, from day one, Premier Ford said that EVs will be built in Ontario by Ontario workers. And with last week's news, we are living up to that commitment. Now, we took the approach of lowering the cost of doing business, reducing red tape, and lowering taxes. As a result, Ontario's position as a leading electric vehicle jurisdiction has been secured with Speaker, $43 billion in investments into Ontario. That is greater than every U.S. state. Companies are choosing Ontario because we have everything the global leaders need in EV production. 70,000 annual STEM grads, 700 parts makers, 500 tool and die and mold makers, 400 Response. connected and autonomous companies, the full EV ecosystem. But, Speaker, most importantly, we have the best talent in the world. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing. We have an affordability crisis, and housing is a big part of it. Tenants across Ontario are experiencing drastic rent increases simply because they live in buildings built after 2018. For example, in Livemore High Park, last year rent was raised by 14 per cent, and this year rent is going up by 13 per cent. With stagnant wages and rents skyrocketing, the cost of living crisis is pushing people out of their homes. Why won't this government provide stability to tenants in the midst of an affordability crisis? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, what we've been doing since day one is, is recognizing the fact that for 
uh, over 15 years, there were very few purpose-built rental uh, housing uh, uh, built in the province of Ontario, which has led to the challenges that we are now facing. Uh, we started back in, t in 2018, as the member uh, talked about, putting incentives in place so that we could build more purpose-built rental housing, and the results have actually been quite staggering, exceeding our expectations, but there is more to work to be done. As you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have the highest level of purpose-built rental housing, uh, not only in the last couple of years, but frankly, in the province's history. So bringing more supply online uh, will help us ensure that we can bring stabilized rents and eventually bring those uh, rents down. Now, when you talk about affordability, Mr. Speaker, of course, it is our government that has brought in measure after measure after measure to make life more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario, Spons? whether it is reducing taxes, Mr. Speaker, fighting the carbon tax every step of the way, the measures that we brought in place to actually make it cheaper and more affordable to build rental housing speaker we're going to continue to be focused on that because it's the right thing to do for the people of thank you and the supplementary question back to the member for parkdale high park tenants across toronto are going on rent strikes they're being forced to take matters into their own hands because this conservative government refuses to reinstate rental protections they removed no caps on rent increases is unfair people don't know what they will be paying next year it could be three percent 10%, 50%, it could double. It's precarious and it's dangerous. No one can build a life like this. Minister, will you reinstate protections you removed and protect tenants from unlimited rent increases? <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member knows that uh, there are indeed uh, uh, continue to be rent, uh, rent controls on buildings prior to 2018. We made the same decision. We made the same decision that was made by the NDP government in 1990. Now, colleagues will know, I never give the NDP government of 1990 to 95 credit for anything. Nothing. Because literally they brought the province to the, the brink of bankruptcy. But one decision that they made, which was on the heels of the disastrous Liberal government from 85 to 90, was to remove rent controls on new purpose-built rental housing. Why? because that spurred on the creation of new rental housing. Now, the NDP government at the time said that they had to do it because the previous Liberal government was so disastrous. I and my colleagues, we copied that great program from the NDP government, Mr. Speaker. We're doing it now. Spons. We're building more than ever before, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your advice on that policy. We'll continue that policy because it's working. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In the galleries today, there are citizens concerned about the cost and health impacts of the climate crisis. In just four days last year alone, toxic air pollution from forest fires cost our health care system $1.28 billion. We have to dramatically decrease climate pollution if we have any hope of our children having a healthy, affordable, and livable future. But Ontario, according to data released last week, had the highest increase in GHG pollution in 2022. And things are only going to get worse with the government's plans to ramp up expensive, dirty gas plants that will increase climate pollution by, get this, Speaker, 580 per cent by 2030. Question. So, Speaker, will the Premier save us money while protecting our health and climate by not ramping up gas plants and investing in low-cost, clean, renewable energy. Minister of Energy. Speaker, as the member opposite knows, we are currently refurbishing our nuclear fleet across Ontario. That includes at Bruce and OPG and eventually Pickering as well, Mr. Speaker. Now, that is emissions-free, reliable, baseload power that is going to continue to power the growth of our province going forward as the Hondas and the Volkswagens and the Stellantis plants and the Umicore plants come online. Now, what the member opposite is proposing in his question is to try and replace all of those megawatts with wind and solar. I just took a look at the Independent Electricity Systems Grid Watch, and it shows that right now, on a very, very sunny day in May, we're getting about 300 megawatts from our entire solar installation across the grid. And we're getting about 400 megawatts 
from our wind power, Mr. Speaker. The capacity just isn't there. That's why we're investing Response. in large baseload nuclear power, so the kids in the gallery can be able to get the electricity when they flip the switch, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to see. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, last year, $1.88 trillion were invested in the green energy transition, over half of that in wind and solar. Do you know why half of it went into wind and solar, almost $600 billion? Because they are the lowest cost sources of electricity generation in the world. Order. So instead of investing in quickly ramping up wind and Order. solar, this government is going to increase climate come inside, come to order. by 580 percent by investing in fossil gas plants, which are more expensive and create toxic air pollution. So, Speaker, my question for the minister is, why not choose low-cost renewable energy where global investment question. dollars are going so we can create jobs and prosperity while lowering electricity prices? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we are, uh, through uh, competitive procurement, procuring new non-emitting resources in our province, but only because we have also committed to ensure that we have battery storage in our province so we can actually use the types of renewables that the member is talking about. We're taking a very common sense approach, Mr. Speaker, but I'll remind the member opposite of what it was like here in Ontario in January, where we actually saw about 26 hours of sunshine, Mr. Speaker, in the whole month of January. Now, can you imagine what would have happened to those people who live on the 40th, 50th floors of condo buildings in downtown Toronto when they want to put solar panels over at Portland Energy Centre in Toronto, which is currently the insurance policy, our natural gas facility, that keeps the lights on, that keeps the elevators going, that keeps Spons. business happening in our province? I will give the member credit. He believes wholeheartedly in what he's saying. He's just wrong, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my the House will come to order. Minister of Energy, Ontario has one of the cleanest electricity systems in the world. Here, here. Nuclear power and hydroelectricity are the backbone of our system, providing low-cost, reliable, and emissions-free electricity. Speaker, the clean energy grid is the envy of jurisdictions in Canada and around the world, yep. and it is a point of pride for Ontarians. But instead of building on our energy initiatives, the federal government continues to force a carbon tax uh, on hardworking shame. Ontarians. The federal Liberals need to face reality, Black. recognize the harms they are causing, and get rid of this tax. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister tell this House Question. how our government is strengthening Ontario's economy through our clean energy advantage, despite the additional challenges imposed by Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. We don't need a carbon tax. We don't need the federal Liberals. We don't need the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, either. And the people in Milton and Lambton, Kent, Middlesex agreed with us last week in the by elections by bringing Z Hamid and Steve Pinson out to our legislature, Mr. Speaker. They wholeheartedly said no to the Queen of the Carbon Tax. They said no to what the NDP was offering. They said no in a big way to what the NDP was offering. What they said yes to was our plan for powering on. Ontario's growth, Mr. Speaker, investing in refurbishments at our can-do facilities across the province, building new nuclear at Bruce Power, building new small modular reactors at Darlington, investing in a competitive procurement for new non-emitting generation, building out the transmission that we need, investing in green steel-making facilities with electric arc furnaces. None of that, Mr. Speaker, involves Response. a carbon tax, and the people of Ontario believe in what we're doing. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. As a result of the proactive measures taken by our government, Ontario's clean energy advantage is doing more than just powering the new homes we are building, but it is also powering the electrification of transportation. But, Speaker, when it comes to the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals, they have continuously voted no to our feasible plan towards electrification. Shame. They would rather support a tax that drives up the cost of daily necessities for their constituents. Our government will always advocate for the people of Ontario and not stop fighting until the federal Liberals finally scrap the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister tell the House how our government is leveraging our energy system to support manufacturing and industry rather than taxing. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, Minister of Economic Development and the Premier are going to back me up on this because they have seen multi-billion dollar investments in manufacturing in our province. As the taillights were headed across the border to other jurisdictions under the previous Liberal government here in Ontario, the headlights are coming back, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing massive multi-billion dollar investments in our EV sector, in our auto sector that was left to die by the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. They're coming back on mass they believe in what we're doing what is the key it's reliable affordable power something that they didn't get under the previous government where they saw electricity prices triple skyrocketing and businesses left because of that now the federal government in Ottawa has imposed this punishing federal carbon tax mr. speaker in spite of all that with the work that we're doing here in Ontario led by premier Ford and our team Response. those investments are happening at a rapid race the people of Ontario the new investors in Ontario can count on this Ontario government mr. speaker thank you the next question the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwecha, Speaker. Uh, Amjananga First Nation closed its band office and sent employees home on April 16 uh, after people became sick with symptoms of associated uh, with high levels of benzene. The First Nation reported last week that they were not consulted on what the Ministry of Environment considers ex an acceptable be uh, levels of benzene. Speaker. Will the minister ensure Amjanong is at all decision-making tables on benzene emissions in Sarnia? Parliamentary Assistant, the member for Windsor, to come see. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, our government's dedication to protecting human health and the environment is clear. That's why last week a decision was made to suspend Anios Dirolution's environmental compliance approval was made. Despite several provincial orders requiring the company to reduce benzene emissions, recent readings at the site continue to be above acceptable levels. So this action will ensure that the facility, currently shut down for maintenance, fully addresses the causes and sources of emissions before resuming operations. The ECA has been amended to require the facility to suspend production operations at the facility, remove all benzene storage from the site, and submit a comprehensive monitoring and community notification plan. We have made it clear that our government expects that swift action is taken to reduce these emissions. And the supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, on Friday, Amjanong uh, issued a notice of violation for both uh, Ineos Styro Solution and the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, seeking immediate remediation of benzene emissions. Amjanong is asking again uh, for a human right of having clean air to breathe. Ontario has failed to protect air quality at Amjanong for generations. Will this government finally listen to their air pollution control recommendations? Member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, we will continue to work with Amjong First Nation to prioritize the health and safety of all residents. Our government will not hesitate to take any further steps or compliance actions that may be required to protect people's health 
and the environment. We've been also, also been working on updates to the benzene technical standards for petrochemical and petroleum facilities, which will impose tougher requirements on facilities like Anyas. We're also working to strengthen the environmental penalties regulation so that more financial penalties can be imposed on bad actors. And we'll continue to take any additional steps and compliance actions that may be required to protect people's health and the environment. So make no mistake, when it comes to protecting health and safety, we will not hesitate to use the various tools and enforcement actions we have at our disposal to hold emitters to account. Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Solicitor General. The Liberal carbon tax is raising the cost of living and burdening families and business across Ontario, especially in rural ridings like mine, Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, where people are worried about the impact of this tax on emergency services in our province. They want to ensure that our police and other emergency response teams have the tools and resources they need to keep their communities safe. The public safety of Ontarians is of critical importance. The federal Liberals need to finally recognize the consequences of this tax and scrap it today. Speaker, could the Solicitor General tell the House how the federal carbon tax is impacting the operations of police and first responders across Ontario? To respond, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, our great, our great, hard-working MPP from Lanark Frontenac Kingston for the question, and, and for his advocacy of public safety in his own constituency. Mr. Speaker, it's completely undeniable. Last week, I went up to OPP headquarters to see for myself to understand just how many boats we have that keep the waterways of Ontario safe, thanks to the OPP. I saw our aerial fleet that goes every day to northern Ontario to fly in communities, and I understood how important it is to have that aviation support. And of course, Mr. Speaker, and I've said this in the legislature, how important it is to have hundreds and thousands of cars on the road that keep Ontario safe and how vital those cars are. Mr. Speaker, it's undeniable. The carbon tax, now 21 cents for a litre of diesel, is affecting our public safety. And you know who knows about it? Body Crombie. Let her come clean with the people of Ontario to say when she was on police service board, she knew it, and now she's saying nothing. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Solicitor General for that uh, response. My constituents will be reassured to hear that our government, unlike the NDP and the Liberals, is listening to their concerns and pri prioritizing public safety. With media reports detailing a surge in criminal activity throughout our province, Ontarians want to ensure that first responders are well equipped and have the support that they need. That's right. But, Speaker, people are concerned about the negative impacts of the Liberal carbon tax on police budgets. With the carbon tax increasing the operating costs of these critical services, it is essential for our government to continue to support the hardworking men and women that keep our community safe. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please explain how our government is enhancing Ontario's public safety framework as police and first responders face additional challenges due to the carbon tax? Good question. The Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's simple. We will stand with everybody that keeps Ontario safe. We're going to stand with our firefighters, our police officers, our probation and parole officers, our correctional officers, everyone that keeps us safe. But the carbon tax is affecting everything. Just last week, I attended at the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs, and I want to give a special shout out to Rob Grinwood, who leads that organization. And he reminded me that an average fire truck of 200 litres that fills up almost every single day is now paying 21 cents a litre for diesel. It's not right. It's not only affecting the public safety side of our communities, our policing side, it's affecting the firefighter side. And it's not right. And that's why our government, led by Premier Ford, will stand up for the people of Ontario every Response. single day and say this carbon tax is bad. Bonnie Crombie knew it as mayor of Mississauga. Let her come clean with Ontarians. Thank you. 
The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last month, Fleming College abruptly announced the closure of 29 programs in Peterborough and Lindsay following the loss of $40 million in international student tuition and years of provincial underfunding. With the college sector facing a projected $3 billion revenue loss over the next three years, Fleming is likely the first of many colleges to slash programs, possibly closed campuses, which will be a huge blow to the communities and local economies that rely on graduates of college programs and the jobs that colleges provide. Uh, speaker, will this government act now to pause the program closures at Fleming and commit to a permanent increase in post-secondary base funding before it's too late? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for that question. And this is exactly what we predicted was going to happen when the federal government made a unilateral decision to cut the number of seats for our colleges and universities. No discussion with the colleges, university sector, none with the, the provinces at all. Mr. Speaker, that's why this government has stepped up in providing $1.3 billion in funding, the historic investment, the largest investment that's been made in over 10 years. We are going to ensure that our schools remain sustainable for years to come. That concludes our question period for this morning. I beg